Good afternoon, ladies and gents, and welcome to ARB Group's uh, webinar this afternoon. It's ARB Group uh, in conjunction with RMIT University presenting Unmanned Aircraft Systems, Challenges and Opportunities in Road Transporta Transportation Research. Sorry, uh, Our presenter today is Dr. Rhys Clothier, and uh, we're very excited to have him join us today, and especially on this topic, because it's unlike anything we've covered in the ARB webinar series previously. So I'm sure we're all very much uh, looking forward to learning more. And just a few housekeeping items before we make a start with the presentation, just to cover off the formalities. My name is Angela Uhas, and I'm the webinar program coordinator here at ARB Group. Um, my contact details are there. Uh, anything training related, uh, please feel free to contact me anytime. Our webinar today will be approximately 40 minutes in length, uh, allowing about 20 minutes for questions. Now please don't wait until the end. Send your questions through as we go. The more interactive we can make the webinar, the more enjoyable it will be for yourselves. We're also recording today's session and everybody uh, in attendance will be receiving a copy of the recording as well as the presentation material. So don't worry too much about taking notes. Uh, a couple of functions of the GoToWebinar system. So we ask that you please type in your questions if you have any for Reese today and they'll come through at our end and we'll answer them as we go. Uh, we also have a raise your hand function. Uh, this will uh, alert us uh, to you if you'd like to ask a question or perhaps answer a question. Now without further ado, I'm going to also introduce David Green of ARB Group. Uh, David will be giving the ARB perspective on uh, this particular topic. David, would you mind uh, introducing yourself and uh, telling us a little bit more about why ARB is interested in uh, unmanned aircraft systems? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Angela. Um, well, I'm a senior engineer in the um, network operations team and, and we're continually exploring new and improved methods of analysing and monitoring both the traffic and, and the road network and its assets to assist road agencies in their, in their tasks. So some of the stuff we're doing involves looking at cooperative ITS, looking at, at probe data, but we're also looking at other technologies and how this may assist road agencies in their tasks. So through that explore, exploration, um, We've identified the potential of unmanned aerial systems in offering an alternative way of analysing traffic and monitoring the health of the road network and its assets. But through this um, exploring their use, we've, while we've identified the potential for many opportunities, we've also identified uh, that they do present some challenges. So we've been working with um, Dr. Reese Clothier from RMIT to explore some of these opportunities and challenges. And this essentially this webinar has been prepared to, to generate interest in the use of unmanned aerial systems by road agencies. And following this webinar would we'll be interested in, in hearing from road agencies who may wish to explore the use of unmanned aerial systems or UIS in their in undertaking their road management tasks. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Therese Clothier, who we've been working with, who can provide an introduction to himself and then also undertake the webinar, which will outline an overview of the UAS and discuss some of their opportunities and challenges for road agencies in their use. So thank you, Rhys. Thank you, David. Um, for everyone listening, my name is uh, Dr. Rhys Clothier. I'm a senior lecturer at RMIT University and the deputy director of the Sir Lawrence Wackett Aerospace Research Centre, which is the um, largest research centre dedicated to uh, aerospace research in Australia. Um, so a little bit of my background. Oh, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I, I get to do a number of these sort of presentations and I really enjoy uh, bringing people up to speed with this very exciting um, industry and emerging technology. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very nice to be able to speak to you all today. Um, so a little bit of my background, I'm actually an avionics engineer. I completed that up in Queensland University of Technology and I worked and helped to establish a, a research centre up in Queensland University of Technology called the Australian Research Centre for Aerospace Automation. It's a bit of a mouthful, but we, it's called ARCA. I worked there for a number of years on some flight test programs as well on the, on the side and that was with Boeing and um, CSIRO and uh, some defence projects as well. 
And then on the side of it, with that, I was also um, completing my PhD in risk and regulation, highly autonomous unmanned systems. So addressing some of the challenges I'm going to go through today. Uh, I was there for a four, I think four or five years before moving down to sunny Melbourne. Um, today is actually sunny, surprisingly. Um, yesterday wasn't. Uh, so and I've moved to RMIT University where I've joined my current role with the Wackett Centre here in the School of Aerospace, Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering. So that's a little bit about who I am. Um, at the moment we, we here at RMIT have a huge number of projects uh, varying um, from projects with very large companies like Northrop Grumman uh, with uh, the Defence Force or DSTO, Defence Science Technology Organisation and we even do some uh, public good uh, work with the Melbourne Fire Brigade and I give a number of my student, students to team them up and help them address some of their techni technical needs as well. And I'll, if I get a chance I'll introduce those as we go. Um, okay, so a bit of an overview of the presentation today. Um, I'm going to start with some fundamentals. I'm assuming I'm going to assume that uh, nobody knows anything. I'm, I'm sure that's not the case. Um, but I'm going to start with what are unmanned aircraft systems, a bit of an explanation of the technology and the current applications, as well as the state of the market in Australia at the moment. And then uh, over the last couple of months, I've been uh, talking to, to David and Carl at ARB, and we're looking at some of the applications or potential applications in road systems management. And so I'm going to discuss and put a few case studies up just to, uh, to get some interest and some um, conversation going around those before uh, closing off with some of the more practical realities and challenges uh, for this technology. <clears throat> so before I get stuck into it, I'm going to ask you all to, um, to do a little, answer a little question for me. And I'll come back to this right at the end of the presentation. But what I want you to do, it's a bit of a, a psychological exercise here cognitive exercise, I want you to write down the first word, and I mean the first word that immediately comes to mind when I say the word which I'm going to put up on the screen. And what I want you to do is write it down and send it through the little um, conversation window uh, through to Angela, and she's going to compile those. And at the end of the presentation, I'll come back to it and we'll have a look at some of those words and some of those connections you made. So when I flash this word up, I want you to write down the first associated word that comes to mind, the first thing that comes to mind. All right, so there it is, drone. What is the first word that comes to mind when I say drone? Oh, so you can all enter your responses in the conference question window. That'll go through to Angela, and she should hopefully see them coming through. I do. Thank and, um, you. We've got we'll a, back to this. Thank you, Reese. We've got a very uh, active audience today, which is great. They're already getting their responses Excellent. through. So um, if everyone can... So you're not like my students. They all... You're not like my students who all sit there and nod their head and play their iPads while I, while I lecture. That's great to hear. Okay, so what are unmanned aircraft? Now, I really do like putting this slide up because it's, it's a quick, quick way to show or highlight a lot of the problems and challenges we have um, as an industry. And that, those challenges are really fundamental. We don't even know how to describe the technology. So this slide really shows the diversity of what, what this industry and this technology captures. If you follow my mouse here, on the bottom left-hand corner, we're talking about little futuristic machines like this automated hummingbird, which is really weighs, I think, about 15 to 50 grams, um, very small, fits in the palm of your hand. And if we go right up to the other side here, we have a global hawk. Now, this is currently the largest unmanned aircraft in production at the moment. There are larger ones coming, but it has a wingspan about the same as a 737-800. So that's what you would jump on um, for a flight between Brisbane and Sydney or Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, Virgin and Qantas operate. So quite a large turbine powered aircraft. Now this sort of aircraft up here can stay on station uh, depending how far it needs to travel for over, over 24 hours, typically 48 hours. Uh, if we start from here and we'll work our way back down to the Hummingbird, but we have uh, on station what we would call pseudo satellites, high altitude blimps and dirigibles that can go to very high altitudes and act, as the name suggests, as a pseudo satellite or even as a comms relay or communications relay. So you, you can imagine losing network towers and putting one of these up and having a cell tower in the sky. So that's, that's one of the main um, drivers for the, the uh, balloons and dirigibles that you see here. Stepping left a little bit further, we have uh, the Boeing, Boeing Phantom Eye. This is a hybrid um, powered aircraft and it's designed to stay for days if not weeks on end. At the moment it's still in the development stage and this is one of its first flights. 
Um, but this is again is trying to tap into that on-demand uh, pseudo satellite market. Something that we, we probably don't think uh, road uh, road management authorities will have too much use for is unmanned combat aircraft. And here's a picture of one of them here. I think it's the X-47B or C. Uh, so we have we are moving towards. Um, unmanned uh, fighter aircraft. I know that there were some statements by the UK Ministry of Defence a couple of years back saying that um, they would not be investing in another manned or a fifth or sixth generation manned fighter. They believe the future is an unmanned fighting fighter aircraft. So if we, we jump down, we've got some transport aircraft. This is actually a K-MAX helicopter that has been, as the word actually suggests, unmanned. So it was a manned helicopter which they took all of the uh, life support systems, a lot of the um, cockpit systems out of, and turned it into an unmanned aircraft, or a remotely piloted aircraft is another term you may hear. So this is for cargo lift um, as well, so I'm not shown this photo is just some underslung um, uh, cargo. Now this platform here is the first of which we're currently operating um, the Australian Defence Force are currently operating is the Heron unmanned um, aircraft and seen some significant deployments and hours over in Afghanistan for our Defence Force and there's some discussion about bringing it back to Australia so it's not just a, a, an asset that's being deployed overseas. Down, stepping down a, a significant jump now to the smaller, smaller unmanned aircraft, this is actually a picture of a Boeing Scan Eagle or an in situ Pacific Scan Eagle to be exact. Um, this platform depending on what it is um, configured as, has a maximum takeoff take mass of around about 20 kilos. Um, so it's significantly smaller than the ones I've shown you um, to the right there. But as you can see, it's quite a novel design. It's got a swing back wing. It can stay on station for over 24 hours. So even though it's small, it can um, offer a significant capability. In a similar size bracket as this one here, which I'm highlighting, this is the Aerosol unmanned aircraft. And anyone who's in Australia who's slightly familiar with the um, unmanned aircraft industry should recognise this platform because it's one of the um, trailblazers of the unmanned systems community right around the world. It was developed right here in Melbourne, and uh, I think it was in the early, late, mid to late 90s, and it actually was the first unmanned aircraft to fly across the Atlantic. And you can find um, that model aircraft in the um, Air and Space Air Flight and Space Museum in the U.S. And Aerosond are uh, still operating down here in Melbourne. They do a, a variety of defence, civil, um, and they also supply and manufacture a large number of these aircraft as well. But we'll get into the applications in a second. We have a number of sort of smaller helicopters. This one's actually quite a large one. It's about 100 kilos. It's called the Yamaha. RMAX, and that's actually in operation in Australia as well. Uh, you can get a contracted service for that. And its main applications are in weed and agricultural spraying. Over to the right, we have fixed wing platforms. This is an Australian platform developed by a company in Western Australia. We have some aerial targets. But probably what you're, you're most likely going to see um, in the next two to five years, if not already, is this explosion in this uh, multi-rotor class of unmanned aircraft. So the two sort of classes that I'm highlighting here. The one on the left is a quad rotor because it's got four rotors. Um, and that has a takeoff mass of about three to four kilos, depending what sort of payload you want to put on it. So a camera or electro uh, infrared sensor or LIDAR or something like that. And they generally have a, uh, a maximum uh, endurance of around 15 to 25 minutes. It really depends on the conditions on the day, how many batteries and what sort of payload you're taking. So you're not going to get hours of flight time out of these, but they do, um, they are emerging as a very viable technology for a wide range of applications. They also present a, a, a lower risk. So there's a number of reasons why this particular sector of the unmanned aircraft industry is emerging. And then right down the left hand side where I started were these uh, hummingbird or small micro class unmanned aircraft. To be honest, we really don't know what we want to do with that class of aircraft at the moment. There are um, obviously a lot of defence applications for them, but in the civil space, we're still uh, yet to see an application emerge for this sort of scale. There's significant challenges of operating this sort of aircraft. Um, they're very susceptible to turbulence and wind, for example. So they're coming, and they're mainly research. So for all the engineers out there and the mathematically inclined, I thought I'd put some um, hard numbers and figures behind some of the statements I'm making. What this actual slide shows is a box plot on the top, 
there's a box and whisker plots, and the same data is actually represented as a histogram plot on the bottom. And what we see here is a log plot, a log histogram of the maximum takeoff mass of different types of unmanned aircraft. So uh, UAS stands for unmanned aircraft. I also characterize the model aircraft fleet and conventionally piloted aircraft. So conventionally piloted aircraft are in red, the unmanned aircraft are in green, and in the blue we have the model aircraft. And what this, these plots, or collection of plots, actually show us are a number of things. Firstly, if you look at the unmanned aircraft, this, this line or this spread here shows the distribution of the, of the fleet. And you can see that it covers un, a model aircraft and gets a fair way and covers at least 75% of the manned aircraft fleet as well. So we're really talking about a very diverse, um, diverse range of unmanned aircraft based on their, their maximum takeoff mass. So very large and very small at the same time. But what is really interesting here when I, when I plotted this, you can see this concentration of unmanned aircraft in the middle, in the section between model aircraft and manned aircraft. And there's a number of reasons for that. The most obvious reason, and one we concluded, was that because of the regulations. We find that 150 kilos is emerging as a, as a regulatory mass limit. So if you get 151 kilo UAV, you're subject to much higher regulation. If you have 149 kilo UAV, you're subject to less stringent regulation. So what we see is a large number of unmanned aircraft, and it's approximately 70% of the fleet, are actually under 150 kilos. The other reason is economic. We see that, and, and the business case is for these, we see that you can develop cost-effective systems for well under 150 kilos. In fact, you can develop them for under 20 kilos. Um, that can have significant capability, endurances, and speeds um, much more superior than manned aircraft. This is another similar plot, but this time I'm only looking at unmanned aircraft and uh, conventionally piloted aircraft. Again, red corresponds to conventional aircraft and green unmanned. What we can really see here is that, again, there's this, I this idea of diversity in the unmanned aircraft. It spans a very large uh, range of operating speed in terms of knots. Um, very slow to very, very fast. So I guess when we talk about unmanned aircraft, we don't talk about aircraft so much. Although we tend to focus uh, in, in, on images and things like that on the flying component, um, we need to change the way we think. And we now start speaking about uh, systems. And if we think of it in terms of a system instead of unmanned aircraft, uh, we need to consider a range of components or elements in the system. All of the elements that I'm showing you here must work together in a cohesive manner to achieve the capability that you need. So I can fly my, I can't, I can't operate my un, unmanned aircraft without a working control station, in particular and a very good communications link as well. So no longer can I look and design my aircraft to just the flying component. There's a broad range of new factors that I need to take into consideration to meet the uh, capability and the requirements uh, for a particular operation. So I've spoken a little bit about the unmanned aircraft, but if I just quickly touch on these other components, we start with the control station. Here I've got a picture of um, one of the Predator-B control stations, so quite a large and capable control station. But a control station can be something as small as an iPad, an iPhone. It can be an RC controller or radio controller, which you see model um, enthusiasts operate. It could be even a laptop. So it doesn't have to look like this. There's a significant diversity in control stations and uh, the different displays and software that needs to run on them. If I look at the remote crew, a typical large unmanned aircraft will take three people to operate. The smaller ones, like the multi-rotors, the quads, uh, you can get away with one, sometimes two, depending on what the CASA requirement is for your particular operation. There's a whole range of new factors we need to consider there, uh, human factors. So, just, just because the person is no longer on board, you would think they would still behave the same way. But we found that humans don't, because you don't have the same vested interests. So when you're flying as a pilot, you know that if you do anything wrong, it's your life at stake. These pilots here are on the ground, and they're actually disconnected from the aircraft. So there's situational awareness challenges. There's psychocognitive challenges about making sure they're not taking unnecessary risks because of that detachment from the aircraft. There's a range of uh, factors because these aircraft are so autonomous that um, the pilots get bored and they miss visual cues when things go wrong. 
Um, sometimes the complexity is too much for them and they have get what we call no confusion. So it's not a simple case of just moving the pilot and connecting them via a comms link to an aircraft. There are a whole raft of new issues around the, the operation of these and the human interaction with it. Now, one of the critical things that uh, really limits unmanned aircraft are communications, particularly in the civil space or civil community. Uh, Defence generally has access to high bandwidth, um, worldwide coverage uh, spectrum. Unfortunately, the civil community doesn't necessarily have the same, um, um, same access to bandwidth. And if they do have access, it usually comes at a really very high cost um, to the operation. So this is really what we call the umbilical cord to the aircraft and uh, the control station. We sever this and we've essentially, um, we don't have a working system anymore. Although we do have highly autonomous unmanned aircraft that are capable of flying home and doing uh, and executing, executing comms outage procedures and a range of emergency um, procedures, generally the comms is still a critical part in the safety case and getting the certification and approval to fly your unmanned aircraft. It also tells you what sort of information you can relay back to the ground station or to the user, uh, what bandwidth and de it determines often how much autonomy is needed on board and what processing is needed on board. It really is a significant driver on the design of the unmanned aircraft. Often overlooked is launch and recovery and support. I've put a little picture here of the Scan Eagle, which is being uh, launched off, off a rail, a sliding rail. Uh, it's a pneumatic one, this one. Um, and it's also recovered off this really neat suspended cable. It sort of hits this cable. So that makes it runway independent. But it also creates a logistical, uh, logistical considerations about um, you need cars or vehicles to tow and maneuver this. You also need the right sort of areas um, to be able to operate them as well. And a number of new safety and workplace health and safety considerations there as well. So it's often overlooked. We can recover unmanned aircraft into nets. We can launch and recover them conventionally in vertical takeoff or or on a normal runway, but, uh, but often we're looking for, in the smaller ones, we look for novel ways to launch and recover them to reduce the need to have a prepared strip or prepared area to launch and recover them. It really um, increases their flexibility and use. And finally, we fly unmanned aircraft for a purpose. Uh, at the moment, they're exploring transportation and automated freighters, but really most of the time we're, we're, we've got sensors on board, be them cameras or LIDARs or radars, and they're relaying information that must get back to a user. Sometimes that's real time, i.e. The, the information needs to get down straight away, or we can accept a, a delayed response where we collect it online, we on, on board, we land, we take a data card off the aircraft and then distribute the information. But we really can't forget the interoperability with the user it's, as it's a driving constraint, particularly on the communications and onboard processing and control systems. So out of the slide, I want you to, to take away one thing, and that's change your pers per perspective that it's just an aircraft or remote control aircraft. There's a whole raft of issues going on here, and we like to think of it in terms of systems. And it's obviously keeping researchers like me very, very busy. So what are the unique cap capabilities? Firstly, unmanned aircraft will not replace manned aircraft. There are particular missions and business cases where, where they are viable, and um, we'll go into those but they, I see them as a supplement to manned aviation. So the absence of the pilot on board actually allows us to do some pretty neat things as an engineer. The starting point is your sensor and application, and we can design anything just from that. It doesn't necessarily need to look like an aircraft that you see nowadays, you know, the, the standard fuselage with some stubby wings out of the side of it. We've come up with some very novel, as you can see, this one here is an octocopter flying arrangement. There's tilted wings, rotor wings, all sorts of novel and crazy creations, but they're designed that way um, to meet the purpose of the sensor or the mission. And the absence of the pilot on board also means we can design them to be smaller. So you've seen the, the really small ones. We can design them to fly faster and pull G, uh, Gs that a, a pilot just simply couldn't, um, couldn't take. We can design them to fly much longer. So we have aircraft that are being designed to stay for days, if not weeks. Um, there are some projects that are looking at years where we use a lot of solar generation and energy harvesting to create um, platforms that fly at very high altitudes. So no pilot really wants to be airborne for that amount of time. So higher or lower, we can fly them at very low um, altitudes off the ground, maybe a few feet to capture high resolution information or data, uh, whereas it wouldn't be safe to do that with a piloted aircraft. But more importantly, and this is one of the, the things we'll get to later in the presentation, is this idea that when safety is no longer an issue, if we're flying in a remote area or an outside of, segregate, uh, outside of um, 
um, airspace that's used by manned aviation at the moment, cost becomes one of the key drivers for this technology. We can um, build unmanned aircraft around a price point or around a business case and to the point where disposable unmanned aircraft uh, have been made and they're particularly used in defence at the moment, but there's, a, there's an avenue for disposable unmanned aircraft in civil missions as well. So all of these capabilities open up a number of particular applications. Generally we like to um, call them dull, dirty, dangerous or demanding. So dull being long or very boring missions. Dirty missions may be um, examples where it's uh, too dangerous to put in, or I'd say uh, a good one is the Fukushima power plant, the nuclear power plant, where it's too much radiation or, or something like that and you don't want to fly a manned aircraft. Dangerous flying into hostile air territory or into cyclones, we've actually done that with man, uh, unmanned aircraft, that's been flown a number of times through cyclones to get some information for NOAA. And demanding missions, so missions that go beyond the physical limits or capabilities of a human pilot. For example, staying on station for a couple of days at a time or pulling significant Gs. So those applications, and th these are the ones that are actually uh, being used in Australia at the moment. I'm going to get through them very quickly because I don't want to talk for too long. But with aerial photography, aerial spotting and aerial sur survey, this is going to be the largest um, application for this um, industry in the next where it currently is at the moment and over the next couple of years. Infrastructure inspection, in particular power lines. Uh, we've got lots and lots of uh, infrastructure out there. We need to check them for weed, uh, uh, sorry, crop growth, um, uh, so, sorry, trees growing into those power lines and potentially causing fire as well as inspecting the condition of the infrastructure itself. Journalism, as this photo here shows, if you see in the little right hand corner I'm indicating now, there is an uh, octocopter flying. Um, and that was taking coverage for ABC uh, on the, the flag raising ceremony on Australia Day. And all of the ones here I'm, I forgot listed have been used at the moment and I'll touch on a couple of them in a bit more detail. We've used them for research and Situ Pacific have been flying a number of missions um, to do mammal or marine mammal surveys. In this case you can see these little white dots here and a couple of hard to see ones here. These are actually dugongs in Moreton Bay up in Queensland and some whales off uh, Stradbroke Island again in Queensland and they were looking at the migration numbers each year. Uh, surf life saving has been uh, identified as a potential application here. Uh, we've used it for research, uh, CSIRO down in South Australia for uh, surveying litter on beaches. And I also touched on this at the start, the Yamaha Armax, which is a helicopter used for crop and weed spraying at the moment. One of the major applications we also have is, um, I'm going to start this video and mute it for you. Um, this is actually the Melbourne Fire Brigade. Um, they are currently operating a small quadcopter. You can see the image in the top left there. And they're using it for situational awareness at um, large incidences. This one occurred, uh, I think it was May last year. This is a Balti Bridge um, accident where a truck collided with a car and then um, was previously uh, suspended over the side of the bridge. And they used the unmanned aircraft to inspect um, the, uh, the truck to see if it was safe to move it. They wanted to see what damage was caused to the asbestos roofing below. Uh, there was a number of ways they used it. But in terms of the um, ARB or potential applications in road and uh, network infrastructure man um, management, you can imagine this being used for damage inspection, uh, accident analysis and data recording um, as well. So they have used it in numerous fire incidents as well. It, it's not common knowledge, but if you're aware of the Morwell um, coal fire and mine fire at the moment um, in sort of the Gippsland region in Victoria, they're currently deployed there trying to map out the fire um, using infrared cameras. So it's under trial at the moment, 12 month trial, and they've seen a lot of benefits out of it. Now this slide, um, there's not a lot of information on the industry at the moment. There are, is, a, is an industry association called the Australian Association for Unmanned Systems and uh, they've been very active in the regulatory space. But from an industry data perspective, there's not a significant amount out there. So I've been doing some Google searching as well as looking at the CASA registered operators. Um, and at the moment, uh, although this slide's not quite up to date, we have about 125 um, people that I can find offering services from unmanned, for unmanned aircraft in Australia. And this shows a distribution or a rough distribution um, of some of those companies. We see that Victoria is a bit of a, a centre um, for, uh, in tradition, to, it has always been a centre for aerospace, but it seems to be attracting most of them. There's about 33% there. New South 
New South Wales 20% and Queensland 15% round out the top three. All right, so to keep you engaged and make sure you're all listening, I've got a couple more questions for you here and, and hopefully we can use this in question time at the end of the presentation. I'm really interested in, as would be Arb, as to um, has your agency already tried the use of unmanned aircraft? We're aware of a couple of agencies that have. Um, and if so, in what applications were you using your unmanned aircraft or did you contract the services of an unmanned aircraft and were there any challenges? So even if you write these down and we can email them through at the end or put them into the question box and send them through to Angela. And the second question here or question three for the presentation is, well, are there any particular applications relevant to your agency where you could use UAS? And hopefully some of the this next following slides will help um, spark some, of that, um, some ideas on how you could potentially use this technology. Okay, so looking at this technology and the capabilities it has, uh, we did brainstorm, I guess, some of the potential applications in um, road, road management and road network management <coughs> and infrastructure management. So the first, the first application, obviously, is, is network and traffic management, and we're particularly interested in um, uh, data products that allow us to capture traffic flows, uh, potential, uh, in this case, no flow. Um, so we can actually get real-time streaming um, of traffic information to a central server. Now, this could be achieved uh, by a number of platforms, and when looking at the technology, it really depends on what the application is. So if you wanted real-time data on a particular location, so a particular roundabout or exit ramp or a small piece of, of road infrastructure, um, the most known, uh, the most applicable technology um, would be multi-rotor unmanned aircraft, because you don't need to go a long way. Uh, you could uh, simply just go up and hover and observe the situation over a period of time. You can have software running either on board that aircraft or on the ground station that counts the flow or um, keeps track of, of the number of vehicles or even the types of vehicles. And then you could send that information back um, to a central uh, data or network, network data storage location. So that's for on-site or known trouble spots. If you wanted to survey or have an on-demand system, so if you, if you wanted to be able to go to a particular traffic um, hotspot on a given day, but you didn't really know where it was going to be, you're going to need to, uh, to lean more towards larger unmanned aircraft, so potentially fixed-wing unmanned aircraft, to be able to capture simultaneous locations, uh, so get a larger bird's eye view, operate at a higher altitude, and also to be able to move quickly to a site and look at a trouble spot and capture data on a trouble spot. So you, you're going to need different aircraft for different applications. The sensors you use, well, it really depends on what data or information you want to catch, uh, to capture. Not, not always would you want to use um, cameras. I know that's the, the main um, um, sensor that's used at the moment on fixed, fixed poles, and also it's been tried on dirigibles as well, with tethered, um, uh, tethered aerostats. Um, but you can also look at other spectra as well. So you can look at um, shortwave infrared, infrared uh, vehicles. And if you look at the thermal infrared band, it's often easier to, to, to pull out a car in thermal infrared than it is um, using uh, uh, electro-optical or visual. So the sensors really depend on the application and what data product you, you would be after. What that sensor is, would do would then drive the size of the aircraft as well. How much power does the sensor have? What is its field of view will dictate how high you need to operate. Its data requirements will then drive communications, whether you, you need a high bandwidth link or a low bandwidth link. There's a whole raft of connections, that, uh, requirements that come out of what um, sensor you need to use. The second area that we're using as a bit of a case study here is in infrastructure management. Um, I've received, personally received a number of inquiries over the years about how um, unmanned aircraft could be used for road condition monitoring. Now that could be routine or shed, uh, schedule scheduled aerial condition monitoring. Um, we have a lot of roads out there and it's difficult to survey them all. We have uh, at the moment available very, um, very high-end LIDARs and other scanning systems that can map the surface to a very high pixel density or high point density. And you could use that information to detect, uh, in, these, in this case, maybe the verges, look at the erosion on verges, uh, potholes, if there's debris on the roads. Um, and that sort of thing. The next, the next thing you could do is if you operate slightly higher and have, or have a higher, wider field of view on your sensor, you could then look at the embankments in the regions, say, below or, or downhill from a road, because you're often worried about what the erosion is downhill or above 
to potential slips as well. Um, for unscheduled infrastructure inspection, you're really responding to natural disaster. I've been caught out in North Queensland a number of times and sat there patiently watching the, um, the website for updates about road opening and road closures. And this is, that's uh, illustrated here on this right-hand side. You could easily fly out to a very remote area and uh, quickly ascertain whether the roads are open or not. Um, there has been some projects to put automated sensors or height level sensors so you could fly over, collect that data uh, remotely um, and have actual pipe data collected by the aircraft and relayed back, flood height data. Also uh, you could look at, as the case with the Balti Bridge as well, a damage to potential infrastructures. This is um, one here. In infrastructure construction and management, often uh, we're looking at building new roads or, or surveying. Uh, potential extensions to other roads. Um, there's a, that's one of the, the bread and butter, I guess, applications for unmanned aircraft we're seeing at the moment. So it's really driven by the camera and the data product you, product you need. If you need high resolution, very accurate data that's comparable to a land, traditional GPS land survey, you're going to need a, a differential kinematic GPS ground station that knows the position of the aircraft very accurately, a very high-end um, inertial stabilization system on board the aircraft, and then you're going to need some very good, um, a very good sensor as well. So it'd be a high resolution camera if you're looking at, um, say, orthographic or, or ground photography, or if you're looking at um, LIDAR for 3D map, point cloud maps or synthetic aperture radar. And the really start, the starting point for all of these discussions when I talk to people about their application is, well, what is the data you need to collect? And that drives the whole design of the aircraft. And so these images here on your right, they're all thing, uh, examples captured for unmanned aircraft. This one here is, is the plan view or bird's eye view of a, of a city and that's captured using camera and you can actually rotate that to get a 3D view like this here. So that was captured off a, system, a small system like this. This one's a swinglet I believe, I've got it correct. And you can buy one of these off the shelf with all of the software built in and they're about between five and ten thousand dollars depending on different options you get. Very small, very capable and it can generate 3D maps of your environment. And this is a low resolution map um, but basically you can imagine spinning this round, zooming in and, and looking at a 3D representation of your world. The accuracy of that really depends on the quality of the sensors and all those other factors I, um, I mentioned earlier. And that technology is also seeing a lot of application at the moment in agriculture as well. Finally, there's traffic management. I know this one wouldn't be very popular with, um, um, with the public at the moment, but you can use these for in enforcement. There's been a bit of discussion about how um, a fixed wing unmanned aircraft would survey a, um, a large stretch of, of highway and conduct vehicle um, speed checks in particular. That would be quite simple to do. Um, there would be a number of issues in terms of, of whether that uh, is considered admissible when it was collected legally and uh, those sorts of things. But it has, uh, unmanned aircraft have been used um, for policing um, purposes or at least law enforcement purposes up in Queensland. There were a number of trials in maritime um, boats and they were trying to check if boats were speeding through um, areas where there were turtles and dugongs and also if they had lines in the water so they were fishing in maritime protection zones. And also they've used it for uh, keeping an eye on uh, crops, uh, so weed crops in, in remote areas. They're waiting for people to come back to tend the crops and then they would um, send in a team to arrest them. So there's been a number of trials in Australia with enforcement-like activities. So a bit of, I guess, precedence or basis we can draw on if it was to see extended to enforcement. Accident breakdown response. Now this one is about getting information very quickly in a timely manner. So there's, there's really two applications. The first one is getting, getting out there quickly to ascertain the situation and, and what the likely delays are and resources that are required. Uh, you would probably need a fixed wing aircraft for that and, and a probably a reasonably large one as well because you want to move from a known base to a situation very quickly. If you're looking at a site specific investigation, accident investigation or you want to do specific infrastructure inspection, you're going to be leaning more towards a multi-rotor platform that can hover, it can perch, it can stare, it can move in closely and inspect, inspect damage as was done by the Melbourne Fire Brigade for the Balti uh, Bridge. So there's, I believe the AFP have, uh, are currently using them for crime scene investigation at the moment to get a new perspective on the layout of the crime scene. And finally, another, the last case study we've got for you today 
is in uh, scheduled condition inspection, uh, particularly where, um, around uh, bridges or hazardous infrastructure. And I've got this case study here, and this is the sort of argument that needs to be, to be um, made for each application and the potential benefits of using an unmanned aircraft versus the manned inspection. So on the left we see this, these guys here rappelling down underneath the, um, the infrastructure, whereas you could possibly uh, use a multi-rotor unmanned aircraft like this. I wouldn't probably use that, that particular type um, due to its configuration. It restricts your viewing angles, but you would use a platform very similar to that. So the benefits and why you'd probably be leaning towards using an unmanned aircraft for this particular one, workplace health and safety, which I'll touch on again, is an obvious driver in this country. Um, the increased availability and frequency of inspection, uh, you really, you can do this on demand, you can actually collect records of, of what the inspection um, was, so you've got some traceability, I guess, that the inspection was carried out, and you can go back and look at how, say, an image captured of a particular crack or a particular condition has changed with time. So you've got some, some evidence or quality assurance records there as well. And you've got a known uh, performance baseline. You know the cameras, you know the systems, you know what their crack detection rates are going to be, uh, those sorts of things. Whereas the human, as, although we like to think they're infallible, they really are a pretty hard beast to characterise when it comes to, to doing tasks like this. Also, with an unmanned aircraft, we can get to areas um, and, and regions which might not be easily accessed by uh, people suspended uh, and on high ropes like this, um, and we can do it very, very quickly. <clears throat> so, those are all the, the neat applications and there's potential, there's very, a large number of opportunities for the technology, but there are some challenges as well. And the first, we like to break these up into four regions. Tech, technical challenges, policy and regulation, economics and public acceptance. Now, policy and regulations, so safety regulations, uh, we're looking at how they integrate uh, with uh, other airspace users as well as what risks they pose to the people and property on the ground. They need to be managed and unmanned aircraft, like any other aircraft, are subject to um, civil aviation safety regulations. So you can't just put an aircraft up and start flying it. And that's one of the bigger difficulties we have from an industry perspective in managing, um, managing people who, who aren't aware of the aviation regulations and safety um, that comes along with operating this technology. It's got to be treated like an aircraft. So safety regulations and standards and the lack of are a significant uh, limitation on, on the man, unmanned aircraft industry. Not so much in Australia. Around the world, we, uh, we're seeing significant restrictions. In the US, you cannot operate these commercially. You can fly if you are associated with a government organization like NASA or NOAA or a university that's got approval, but there is no legal commercial services that can be offered in the, F in the U US. So you see plenty of things on the web, lots of guys earning money for real estate organizations and the like, they're doing it illegally. In Australia, we've had a very forward-thinking regulator since 2002. We've actually, we're the first in the world to have regulations, and those regulations were very pragmatic. They looked at the risks, they, um, they balanced them off and said like, uh, like that a high-risk unmanned aircraft would be regulated to a higher safety standard. A low-risk unmanned aircraft would be operated to a lower, a lower, be subject to a lower safety standard. And that's allowed our industry to really grow. As a, as a commercial industry in Australia. So we're actually quite a way ahead of people around the world. We obviously have some privacy regulations as well that we will need to, to look at. And last week, um, if you're in the, reading the papers, there was a um, House of Representatives roundtable discussion uh, in Canberra exploring specifically privacy in drone. and So that was a very interesting conversation to be part of because they're looking at legislation around things like CCTV camera, Google Glasses, your iPhones and the misuse of those sort of devices, and that also applies to unmanned aircraft. Although there's no regulations at the moment that are specific to unmanned aircraft, there could be in the future. There are important export control regulations as well, but I won't, I won't go into those today. A big driver for this industry is the economic argument. Unmanned aircraft will not replace or compete with many manned aviation and manned, manned aircraft. If you want to fly you've got more than enough pilots who will fly for almost free just to get their hours up. So when you start to get to those larger, um, uh, larger, um, larger aircraft, it can't just be on cost alone. There has to be some other factors that are driving the business case, be it safety, the workplace health and safety argument, or you get a better data product as a result. So 
there's a lot of factors driving the business case for unmanned aircraft. The personnel costs, um, unmanned aircraft, despite the name, aren't unmanned. You're going to have people involved in their operation, maybe one, maybe two people, and they are a significant component to the cost of unmanned aircraft. And to get that down, we're really looking at autonomy, increasing the level of autonomy, and also looking at the regulations that currently mandate you know, how many people are required to operate an unmanned aircraft. Insurance, cost-effective insurance. Um, as an association, we are looking, a bit, industry association is looking at how we can and drive that down. The insurance market is pretty small at the moment. Um, so we're in that, that sort of embryonic stage of, as, an economic, as an industry. So we need to grow so that we can come to that stage where in cost-effective insurance become available. There are competing industries. We've got satellite services. We've got communication services. There's the manned aviation, if you'd like to view it as a competing industry, that need to be considered when using this technology. And there's, there's um, considerations that a lot of large number of companies are going through at the moment is they're interested in um, unmanned aircraft technologies, but they're unsure of what the best business model is, whether they go out and contract a service from one of the many service providers in Australia, or do they develop their own in-house capability to meet their own needs. Now this goes, public, public acceptance of a new technology is one of the most significant issues facing, um, facing the, the future of this industry. Um, and this goes back to my first, my first question I opened up with. So Angela, can you give me what the top couple of um, words that came out when, when we said drone? What were the responses? Thanks, Reese. Um, yeah, look, the, the top three most popular choices here were war or warfare, army and robot. A um, couple of other interesting responses too. Um, we had uh, flying, hovering, and spying, which I thought was uh, would, uh, oh, quite a good spying. one. Flying, excellent. <laughs> okay, that's great. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Now, we're doing a lot of research at the moment with a number of companies to understand what people think. Um, we know that they perceive the risks to be a little bit higher, uh, and even though we can show that the risks are the same, or if not lower, people generally fear things they don't understand. And unfortunately for this industry, we've got a lot of bad press in terms of um, connections that unmanned aircraft have really been shown as weapons of war. And we see that in, as number one coming out here in your responses. So they've seen a lot of airplay, you see Predator Bs launching missiles on terrorist strikes, and, and that's what people generally perceive this technology is used for. The idea that they have a civil or commercial benefit and that they can change the way we, uh, you know, we drive to work or the conditions of our roads, um, that's not yet clear to people. So if I ask my mum or my dad, or they may be a little bit biased because they know I'm in this area, but if I ask just a general member of the public what they thought, we would get these, these sort of responses. And the drivers are what they've been exposed to as well as their perception of their benefits. There's also the, this term drone. If I changed the term and said unmanned aircraft or remotely piloted aircraft, I'm likely to get a different response. And we're doing some broad surveys and research at the moment to understand what's the best way to address um, public concern just through terminology and communication strategies. Uh, moral and ethics of use, not so much an issue for civil commercial platforms, definitely one for the defence about uh, weaponising unmanned aircraft, for example. Privacy, which I've touched on perception of benefits would have touched on, but one for an industry problem here and one that you may be aware of if you've had any interaction with an unmanned aircraft service provider is that we're really running a two-speed industry here where we have um, people who, who are professional members and have got the right safety approvals um, to operate, conduct their operations and those that really have just bought something from China and start operating an illegal service. And so we're having this is issue with industry and uh, like what we call cowboys and the technical issues as well. I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna jump forward a little bit here. There's really two drivers in, in for un unmanned aircraft, for, in particular for Australia. We have a lot of infrastructure. It's distributed over a very large land mass, and we have a very small population and in sort of GDP to support it. So we really need to look at novel ways of maintaining our infrastructure. So power line companies are already investing in this technology, including uh, other companies, including um, uh, commercial network providers uh, for communications like Telstra um, and, and Siemens are looking at it. So there's a number of companies mining as well. We, the other major driver for Australia is legal. We have workplace health and safety regulations that put a requirement on us to explore alternate technologies that reduce the risk to our pe the public and our employees. And in many cases, unmanned aircraft are uh, a, a viable consideration. 
Okay, so I'm going to hand over back to David here because I think I've spoken way over time. Um, That's okay, so thank you. Just, uh, you're right there, David? Yeah, yep, got it. Yep. Thank you, Reese. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for providing that overview on unmanned aircraft systems and, and presenting some of the, the challenges and opportunities that they present. And so uh, to the audience, I, I hope you can now appreciate um, that our unmanned aircraft systems has the potential to be used for a variety of uses in, in road management from monitoring traffic and some of the responses um, that we got back to your earlier question highlighted this with uh, Jerry Ambrose saying that they've been using it for short-term traffic counts um, to inspecting assets to overcome OH&S issues and, and Douglas uh, Blankson identified that they've been used to um, inspect inaccessible areas and to overcome health and safety following an event, cycling and for use in traffic, traffic modelling. And then also other um, uses include aerial view of the, of the road network um, as presented by Victor Lamb who, who said that they've been used, at, used as an aerial map of a local government area and also as represented by that MFB video to show how it's been used to look into uh, an incident on the, um, on the Melbourne freeway network. So from here, I guess ARB and RMIT are, are interested in hearing from road agencies and local government authorities who may wish to explore the use of unmanned aircraft systems. And in particular, the network operations team at ARB for which I'm, I'm a member of, are particularly interested in, in trialling the use of unmanned aircraft systems in, in the network operation space. And potential test cases could, in, could include exploring the use of unmanned air, aircraft systems to monitor a congested road network in order to better understand the formation of congestion in that network. And so, yeah, I guess um, on to the next slide, Reese. Sorry about that. There we go. Yeah, so if, um, if you're interested in, in looking at trialling unmanned aircraft systems in a road environment, please feel free to contact um, my, t my manager, Dr Charles Carl, at the, at the details presented on your screen, or myself, uh, David Green, in the network operations team, and the, and the details are provided up on the screen. Or if you've got some general inquiries about unmanned aircraft systems, uh, please present them to Dr Reese Cl Clothier. Absolutely, and look, I'll just interject and, and thank everyone for their, their time and attendance today, and of course, uh, Dr. Reese and David as well for joining us. Uh, we have had a couple of questions come through. Now, I know that um, you know maybe um, the information presented today may be a bit to, to digest for a lot of our audience, and uh, so if any questions or comments come to mind, Post-webinar, of course, you're most welcome to contact uh, any of the uh, people listed on your screen there for, for a discussion or answers. Um, before we finish up, though, um, I guess we do have a couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Reese, if you don't mind uh, perhaps answering those before we... Yeah, no, no problem at all. I'm all right. sorry I spoke for so long. I was meant to leave you 20 minutes to speak, but unfortunately got carried away. No, that's all right. Um, I think um, the the presentation was certainly interesting enough, so it was um, it was glad to to learn more about this sub subject. And we have a question from Victor. Victor's asking, could this replace current traffic surveys using pneumatic tubes or video technology? What are the cost implications? Well, I haven't done a comparison between those particular technologies. Um, it definitely could, depending if you wanted an on-station constant um, uh, constant uh, data input like those uh, that they currently provide through the pneumatic and the uh, sort of these the electromagnetic um, loops and things like that. Um, you would need a, a probably a high altitude unmanned aircraft. The difficulties there would be uh, weather and the types of sensors. It would be a significant cost, I think. So. This, this highlights that, um, you know, that, that every potential application would need to be uh, investigated on its own merits because I'm not sure if, you know, if the, the, it'll stack up for all of them. I would probably see in the short term, um, in terms of, of road traffic flows and counts and things like that, it'll be the on-demand at a known local 
application, so a hot spot where you want to do a targeted study. And that's for a number of reasons. A, the cost and the technology is already there, so we can do this with a, a multi-rotor platform. And B, getting the regulatory approvals is much easier at a known location where you can do a fixed uh, risk management plan or you fly from a, say, a clear area, remain under 400 feet, those sorts of things. The moment you want to do something a little bit more adventurous, you want to get a little higher or start to fly something a little larger, you start to in inherit a lot more um, regulatory burden, shall I describe it that way. So that's overcoming that will be um, a significant driver on the cost of the operation as well. So I might just in that space, in that particular application, it would be the smaller unmanned aircraft. Yeah, I might just add a bit further on that, Reese. Um, I think it really depends on, on the type of traffic survey you want to do. Um, I think as Reese kind of highlighted in the, in the presentation, unmanned aircraft systems are still manned. They're just not manned in the, in the aircraft. And, and so you, you therefore have the, have the operation costs associated with keeping that unmanned aircraft system in, in the sky. Um, so in terms of actually wanting to do a traffic count um, for, say, a 24-hour period or, or a long term, um, then your more traditional technologies might be appropriate. And, and ARB is also looking into other technologies to provide that information. So we can talk to Victor further on that um, offline. Uh, but in terms of the things that we're kind of more focusing on is trying to understand how congestion can, can quickly form on a road network. So looking at how we might be able to use air, unmanned aircraft systems uh, to um, get an aerial view over, over a congested hotspot and to see how it can go from free flow to congestion conditions in, in a matter of, matter of minutes and how that may impact on, on neighbouring intersections or, or upstream or, or downstream of that, uh, of that road section. So we're, we're more looking at um, how we could use unmanned aircraft systems to uh, get an aerial view over more short term um, time frame. So, yeah. Wonderful. All righty. Uh, and look, just to reiterate what I mentioned earlier is that today's webinar was in fact uh, recorded. So anyone uh, who's interested in viewing it again uh, um, or perhaps uh, sharing the link with their colleagues or friends is, is most welcome to. Please do keep an eye on your email as we'll be sending this through in an email in the next day or two. Um, David, any closing comments from you? Um, no, no more further comments. Um, as you can see, we've got our further information up on, up on, the, on the screen. So um, if you want to contact us with any queries, uh, please feel free to do so. Wonderful. And uh, Dr. Reese, thank you so much for your time. It's been a really interesting presentation and uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, unlike anything we've covered before in the ARB webinar series. So it's been a, an absolute pleasure and hopefully you can join us uh, again in future. Well, you're most welcome and look, I encourage anyone to, if you've got any um, inquiries or just questions, feel free to contact me. I didn't leave you much time today, but um, I'm just even if it's just general industry um, stuff, I can point you in the right direction. So more than welcome to field any emails or questions that you may have. Wonderful. And thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. All right, everyone, thank you for your time in joining us today. We hope that you can join us for future ARB webinars uh, as well. And uh, keep an eye on your emails. You'll be receiving something through from me shortly. Have a great day, everybody. Goodbye.